So great to be with you today. We are going to uh, start a new message series today. Uh, we're going to take on the book of Hebrews this summer. And uh, so today we'll be in chapter 1. There's 13 chapters in the book of Hebrews. And I'm telling you this now because you can actually prepare for coming to church. You can read Hebrews ahead of time. And uh, we'll handle about a chapter a week or so. So you can be reading ahead. Um, and, and we're going to take on a theme as we go through the book of Hebrews. Uh, Jesus is greater. You're going to see that pop up and rise to the surface uh, you know, frequently as we go through this book. Um, so I ran across a story again that I, I've read before, but I thought it was pretty cute and it fits pretty well. Uh, it's about a little boy who thought he was the greatest baseball player in the world. And um, he was seen one time uh, or overheard talking to himself as he strutted through his backyard. He's wearing his baseball cap. He's toting his baseball bat and his baseball. And he proclaims in a loud voice, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he throws the ball up and swing and a miss. Strike one, he says. That didn't you know, that didn't discourage him. He kind of straightened his cap, and he said it again. I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he throws the ball up, swing and a miss. Strike two, he said. He's still determined. He kind of spits on his hands, you know, rubs them together. He's going to go to throw the ball, and he says it one more time. I'm the greatest hitter in the world. Throws the ball up, swing and a miss. Strike three. Wow, he exclaimed. I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at me. Speaking of great, one of the greatest introductions to a book of the Bible is actually in the book of Hebrews. There are classic introductions in the Bible. One of them would be the book of Genesis, the first book. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Another one would be the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the book of Hebrews, there's also sort of a classic opening line. We can see it here in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom He made the universe. So when you look at these opening verses, a couple things stand out, at least to me. Number one, God is speaking. God has always been speaking. In the past, he spoke through the prophets. But in these last days, he's speaking through his son. God primarily communicates to earth through the son, Jesus Christ. So that's one thing that stands out to me. Another thing that stands out to me is that Jesus is exalted. Jesus is greater. He's greater than the prophets. Why is he greater? Because he's the heir of all things. Everything belongs to him. And more than that, he's the creator of all things. He made all things. Jesus is greater. And so that's the theme we're going to kind of be looking at. Uh, when you look at the Jesus is greater theme, on the next slide, it kind of tells you the words that are used in this whole book of Hebrews uh, that sort of describe that. You'll find that Jesus is described as better 11 times in the book of Hebrews. He's described as being superior four times, and he's described as being greater seven times. And, and in the next slide, it tells you what, what is he better than, what is he greater than, what is he superior to. Well, in chapter 1, we just read it, he's greater than the prophets. In chapters 1 and 2, we're going to see that it describes Jesus as being superior to the angels. Chapter 3, it talks about Jesus being, you know, above Moses. Chapter 4, it's Joshua Chapters 5 to 9, there's this little section that talks about the priesthood and the high priesthood, and there's some mysterious stuff in there, but it says Jesus is greater than even the high priest. In chapter 9 itself, it describes Jesus as being 
better than the tabernacle. And in chapter 10, he's greater than all the law and all the sacrifices that have ever been made. Jesus is greater. Now, just to kind of help lay a foundation for the book, let's just do something by way of introduction. When was this book written? Most scholars believe it was before A.D. 70. The reason they believe that is because the temple in Jerusalem is referred to in the present tense. And in A.D. 70, the temple in Jerusalem was completely destroyed. So probably written somewhere between 64 and 68, somewhere in there. As far as who wrote it, this is a little more mysterious. Early tradition kind of uh, said that it was the Apostle Paul that wrote it. Uh, later on, that sort of became into question. In the third century, the uh, early church father, Origen, writes that he thinks that we can't know or we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. You see, Paul always introduced himself in his letters and sometimes would even conclude and say, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. There's nothing like that in the book of Hebrews. Uh, uh, Ter Tertullian or Tertullius, I can't remember his name. He, he was a prolific Christian writer uh, in the second and third century. And he actually writes that he believes it was Barnabas that wrote the book of Hebrews. So I would say, you know, we can't know for sure. If you want to say that it's Paul, you're in good company. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, whenever he would preach on Hebrews, he would give credit to Paul. I'm going to say the writer of Hebrews when I refer to it, and I will be right. Okay? So we're, I guess all that to say, we're just not sure who wrote it. Okay, the recipients were Hebrew Christians. It's the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, they were the uh, Jewish believers, the ones who had come to receive Jesus uh, as Messiah. Today we would call them Messianic Jews. Okay, so that's the audience that's being written to. And the purpose is to exhort and encourage these believers, because they were believing in Jesus as Messiah, for them to remain diligent in their faith, not to become spiritually lazy or legalistic. Some were sort of stepping back from embracing Jesus as Messiah. And so that's one of the reasons for this letter. There had been intense persecution during this time frame where this book was written in 64 to 68 AD, uh, Nero was the emperor in Rome. And especially at the end of his life, Nero was especially cruel to Christians. You've read church history. Many were persecuted. Many were put to death in just horrific evil games. That was Nero. And so the Jews had, become, had come under less scrutiny than the Christians. So the temptation was, Let's maybe step back into Judaism. <laughs> There's less threat there. There was also family pressure for the Jewish people that came to embrace Jesus as Messiah. They would come under ridicule. And, um, and so, you know, the temptation was to step back. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to encourage them to move forward. Don't retreat. Listen, uh, it's probably not a lot different today when we want to passionately follow Jesus with our lives. In our country, we don't, we're not under physical threat, but we do come under ridicule sometimes for our Christianity, for those that want to really keep Jesus number one in their lives, to serve him wholeheartedly. There might be cultural pressure for Christianity. There might be, you know, rejection of sorts, maybe mockery at times. Perhaps there's family pressure when your family doesn't quite understand this whole, you know, passionate connection that you have to Jesus. And so we could use encouragement too. And so I think this letter would be a, a good one to go through to be encouraged. Now, Jesus is greater than anything good. Right? A lot of times we think, oh, he's greater than anything bad. But he's also greater than anything good. And chapter 1 is going to outline many specific ways that he's greater. And one thing I want you to notice is how many times the writer quotes the Old Testament, especially in chapter 1. Every time you see something in quotation marks, you're going to see that uh, this is a quotation of an Old Testament verse. And if you have a study Bible or a reference Bible, next to that verse, uh, there might be a little letter, and then on the bottom of your Bible page, it'll say what that Bible verse is, or it might even have the verse right next to the quotation verse. So you can tell where that is. 
And here's why the writer of Hebrews is using so much Old Testament scripture. Because a, a, a genuine Jew would have a high view of scripture. They would believe that these were the words of God to his people. And so the writer would use that to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is greater. Don't give up. Keep moving forward. So lots of Old Testament scripture being quoted here. All right. Um, so let's jump in. We're going to read the rest of chapter 1. Have no fear. It's only 14 verses. Uh, we'll start now from verse 3 because we already read the first two. Listen to what it says here. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens and the earth are, uh, are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So, I just want to point out four things, uh, four ways that Jesus is greater. Here's the four points up front. Jesus is greater because Jesus is creator. Jesus is greater because Jesus is divine. We see this in chapter 1. Jesus is greater because Jesus is redeemer. And Jesus is greater because Jesus is supreme. All right, so let's kind of run through those four. The first one, Jesus is greater because Jesus is creator. All things were made by him and through him. This thought is evident in a couple of verses in chapter 1. The verse we're really going to camp on today is verse 3. There's so much packed into verse 3. Hebrews 1, 3. And through whom he made the universe. Now referring to Jesus again a little further in chapter 1, in verse 10, this is quoting an Old Testament scripture, Psalm chap chapter 8, verse 5. It says, he also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. This is saying, Jesus is the creator. This is also in other parts of the New Testament. We see this. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, the first three verses. I quoted it earlier, the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Now, you might argue, well, how do you know that's about Jesus? Well, you just have to go down to verse 14 of John 1, and it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this word that it's talking about is Jesus Christ. He made everything. There's nothing that was made ever except through Jesus. Now, I love this that Jesus is described as the Word because that's the power of creation. You remember in the book of Genesis, the, the creation story, God spoke things into existence just by His very words. 
like, you know, let there be light. The Apostle Paul, we know that the Apostle Paul wrote Colossians. It sounds a lot like Hebrews in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. He said this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is describing Jesus Christ. What I like about this verse is it's not just the things you see, right? So you can observe creation around you. You can observe the planet, the plants, the animals, the people around you. You can look in the sky and see the stars and the planets, and you think, wow, Jesus made this. But it also says he's the creator of invisible things, of things you can't see, the creator of heaven, the creator of angels, the creator of all powers and all authorities, the invisible things. Jesus even made those things. Jesus is the creator of all things. This is really an amazing thought. Have you looked at creation lately? Have you pondered the awesomeness of creation? You know, if you look at yourself or look at the person sitting next to you, the wonder of the human body is absolutely mind-blowing. The plants and the animals, the stars and the planets, whew, Jesus made that. Listen, people can be creative. Jesus creates. There's a difference. There's a concept in Hebrew called ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means out of nothing. People are creative, but they need something to be creative with. They have to start with something, you know, a sculptor or an artist or a musician. They start with something and they create something beautiful. But Jesus starts with nothing, and just by the word of his mouth, he creates it into existence. Try that. He's creator. You know what that says to me? He's all-powerful. This is encouraging to me. This would encourage the Hebrew believers. It's not just God, the creator. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, creator. Believe in him. Put your faith in him. Nothing's impossible for him. When Jesus speaks, things happen. Look to him when you have a problem. He's the creator. That's one way to be encouraged about Jesus being greater. Uh, here's another way. Jesus is divine. We see this in Hebrews 1. He reflects God. He receives worship as God. He's actually, in Hebrews 1, declared to be God. Again, this thought is in Hebrews 1, verse 3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. If you read the King James Version, it says, He is the express image of God. When you look at Jesus, you're looking at God. When you study Jesus, you're studying God. When you learn about Jesus, you're learning about God. He's the exact express image of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, recently, I had to have one of my teeth crowned. I actually have several crowns. You could sing, crown him with many crowns. That's me. My dentist said this is my last one. Probably I'm going to hold him to that. Anybody here ever had a crown in your mouth? It's not so pleasant, right? I mean, why can't they just put the crown over the broken tooth or the, you know, deteriorating tooth? No, they got to grind that tooth down to a little stump before they put the crown on. And then what they do is they put this rubber, clay, I don't know what they do, but they put this mold in your mouth, you know, to, to mold that. So, and then they press it in real tight and they tell you to bite down. And then when they go to take it out, it's like hard to get it out. The dentist is like pulling it kind of, and it finally comes out. And in that is an impression of the piece that's left in your mouth. Because what they're going to do is they're going to send that off to the person that makes the crown, and they're going to make the exact representation of that impression so the crown perfectly fits and is seated over what is left of your tooth. Do you know the Hebrew word for the express image of God is that same word for impression, the exact impression. That's why I thought of my crown. 
because that mold is the exact impression of what's left in my mouth. Jesus Christ is the exact impression of God on earth. That's Jesus. He's divine. In John chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, it says, anyone, this, these are the words of Jesus, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Jesus is the exact representation of God. Jesus also receives worship as God. We saw that in Hebrews 1, verse 6. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, talking about Jesus, let all God's angels worship him. Listen, Hebrews understood that only God alone should be worshiped. That's the first commandment. And the angels do worship Jesus. Read the book of Revelation. The angels will worship Jesus. They will fall down before him and recognize him as God. And then in Hebrews 1, Jesus is declared to be God. Hebrews 1, 8. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, so this is talking about Jesus, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. Now, this is where we need to explain the concept of the Trinity. Let's be clear. We are monotheists. Christians are monotheists. That means we believe in one God. But we believe, as Christians, in this mystery of the Trinity, that God is represented in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so that's how this, that can that represents the Trinity. This verse represents the principle of the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the New Testament. It's nowhere in the Bible. If you find it, will you come tell me? But there's a lot of representation of the Trinity in the Bible. Go back to the creation story, Genesis chapter 1. When God was creating man, it says, let us create him in our image. It uses the plural form of the pronoun. Let us create man in our image. There's a reflection of the Trinity there. How about at Jesus' baptism? All right, you've got Jesus the human walking into the water, and then, you know, so that's the Son of God, and you have the Holy Spirit that comes down as a dove. That's the representation of the Holy Spirit, and you have the voice of the Father that comes out of heaven. This is my beloved Son. In Him I am well pleased. So it's a mystery, but that's how God can say to God the Son, you are God. Jesus is declared to be God. And as God, he deserves our worship as we worship God. He deserves our allegiance. He deserves our obedience. Listen, Paul said, you know, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It will happen. Every soul ever born will make that declaration. Every knee will bow. You get to decide to do that now. And recognize him as God now. Jesus is greater because he's creator. He's greater because he's divine. The third point, Jesus is greater because he's redeemer. He provides purification of sins and salvation is found in him alone. This makes him greater. This thought again is evident in Hebrews chapter 1. Guess what? Verse 3. Verse 3 says, after he provided purification for sins... He sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven. I love that image. Jesus sat down. You know what that image is telling us? It's done. It's finished. He completed it. The work is done. Salvation is accomplished. Jesus provided purification for our sins by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. It's done. Now, what's left, there's nothing left for him to do, but there's something left for us to do to receive that purification. We have to sort of, not sort of, we must realize that Jesus did that on our behalf, that this is where our purification for sin comes from. It comes from what Jesus did on the cross. And so you need to, by faith, look to him for your forgiveness. And when you do, you receive that cleansing, that purification of sin. Jesus is Redeemer. Forgiveness comes by Him and through Him, and there's no other way. 
You don't deserve it. You can't work for it. It's a gift of God. It's by his grace. Um, recently, I, I, was, uh, I traded in one of my old cars. I had a 2008 Subaru Outback. I love that car, but it was time for it to go. One of the things that I didn't like about that car is it had a, a slow oil leak, a little drip. Nothing major, but it would drip on my garage floor, and that just annoyed me. You know, if we went to visit somebody, it would drip on their driveway. Sorry if I did that to you. <laughs> and I would put oil absorber on the floor. You know, they sell that in the auto department, and you put it down, and it kind of absorbs the oil. And then when I uh, sweep my floor and scrub my floor, there's a, a liquid you can pour on there, and you can kind of scrub to try and get the oil out. But guess what? There's a stain there still today that I, I, I don't know how to get the stain off. I can't get it off, actually. I've tried everything. It's dry. There's no more oil, but there's a stain there. And, you know, here's the thing. Sin creates a stain in, in your life. It creates a breach or a break in your relationship with God. And there's no getting over that except through Jesus. And he provides purification for sin. That means the stain goes away. He doesn't just absorb the stain. He abolishes the stain. He obliterates the stain. The stain is gone. Last week we quoted that scripture verse that says, he removes our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. The two shall never meet. Jesus purifies us from our sin. This is good news. This is encouraging news. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah 1, verses 18 to 20. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Most people quote the first two verses of that verse and leave out the last two. The last two is not like a threat from God. It's not a threat. It's just an expression of reality. <laughs> it's like a warning. You have a choice. You can either engage your faith to believe that your sins can be completely purified or you can resist and rebel. You get to decide. We need to look to Jesus, trust in Jesus. He is greater. He's our redeemer. He's our forgiver. He's our purifier. He's our cleanser. He did it. John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, very familiar verses. We claim to be without sin. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify. There's that word. That word could be translated cleanse. Purify us from all unrighteousness. He makes us clean. He doesn't just absorb our sins. He abolishes them. Okay? Jesus is greater. Here's the last one. He's greater because Jesus is supreme. He sustains all things and rules all things now and forever. This thought again is evident in the first chapter of Hebrews. Guess which verse? Verse 3. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus holds everything together. In our universe, in our world, in your world personally. This is where I forget sometimes. You know, I'm just going to confess to you, sometimes I doubt this, or I forget it, or I don't know what happens. But when life feels out of control, I feel like it's really out of control. But when I'm a follower of Christ, when I'm putting my trust in him, my faith in him, Jesus holds all things together, even in my personal life. Because he loves me. It would be true for you as a follower of Jesus. He's holding it all together in your world. But also in a wider uh, perspective, Jesus holds all things together on planet Earth. In the universe. Now, politically, in our country and even across the planet right now, there's some reasons to have anxiety. 
But as a believer in Christ, I want to encourage you, Jesus holds all things together. There's nothing that's going to cause him anxiety politically on our planet. There's nothing that's going to surprise him. He's not worried about anything. Listen, I think we have a responsibility as citizens of a great land to express our belief, our opinion, um, and to, you know, practice our right to vote. We should do that. But ultimately, as followers of Jesus, you can relax. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got it covered. Nothing is going to happen outside of his purview. And, and God has a plan for history. And it will unfold according to his plan. He's in control. Jesus is greater because Jesus is supreme. He even rules over angels. They worship him. They serve him. He's on the throne of heaven. Look at Hebrews 1.8. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever. And here's the good news. Eventually, Jesus will conquer every enemy, and he will put everything under his feet. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? This thought really encourages me. When I feel like something's over my head, I engage my faith to believe that it's under Jesus' feet. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So as we wrap this thing up and the worship team kind of slowly makes their way back up here, just one last thing. I, I want to encourage you to do a little homework this week. If you use the message notes insert, then you saw this at the bottom. There's a uh, it doesn't quite look like that, but there's just a line that says Jesus is greater than, and then there's a blank line. And I'd like you to encourage to think about what is it in your life that you need to keep in mind that Jesus is greater than. And it's not just that the bad things come to mind right away, but it's also the good things. We need to be reminded that Jesus is greater than the good things. He needs to stay at the top of even all of my other relationships, my relationship with Jesus needs to be greater. My connection to the world and the things that are a blessing to me, I need to remember that Jesus needs to be greater. I mentioned to you that I traded in an old car. I was blessed to be able to buy a new car. I haven't had a new car in a lot of years. And, you know, I'm sort of obsessed with keeping it clean. Yesterday, before I came to church last night, I washed it and waxed it. And then as I'm preaching, the skies, the heavens opened up and it just started to pour rain. And even as I'm speaking the message, I'm thinking, oh, no, my car. <laughs> yeah, that's why that happened. I'm sorry. So even our material possessions can sort of rise up and become a distraction to us. So Jesus needs to be greater even than the good things in our life. And then obviously he needs to be greater than the hard things because they can consume your thoughts. Maybe it's a marriage struggle or a family struggle. Maybe it's something happening with your kids or your grandkids and it's a heartbreak to you. Maybe it's a health battle and that's the thing that kind of consumes your thoughts or maybe it's just hard for you to be in life right now because of pain. Maybe it's a mental battle or an emotional one and, and you struggle with, with depression or anxiety or panic attacks. Listen, folks, these things are very real. Jesus is greater than that, too. Maybe it's a spiritual thing. Maybe you're in a really dry place. Maybe, there's, maybe things are confusing for you spiritually. Guess what? Jesus is greater than that, too. Maybe it's a financial thing. You're under financial pressure. You've got too much month at the end of the money. You know what? Jesus is greater than that too. So I would encourage you to fill in that blank with the thing that sort of dominates your thinking that you really need Jesus to be greater than. So we'll have you stand and our prayer team already making their way to the corners. We end every church service with folks that are willing to pray for you. If you came with a burden today and 
you just want to have encouragement prayerfully, this would be a great place to do that. We're going to sing one last song, then we'll pray together one more time. This is a song that was introduced to us last weekend. I love this. If you listen to Christian radio, you've heard this Chris Tomlin song, Holy Forever. It really exalts Jesus. And can I just encourage you, don't worry about what you look like or the person next to you. Just engage your mind in connecting with Jesus who is greater. Will you do that this morning in this last song? We'll sing it together and then we'll pray one more time. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song. Oh, bro.
one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just open our, our minds today? Would you help us to see you as you are, King of kings, Lord of lords, God over all creation. Thank you, Jesus, today that you are creator, that you are redeemer, that you are God, that you are supreme. There's no one like you, no one above you. And when we see you that way, help us to honor you that way with our lives, in the way that we think, in the way that we speak, in the way that we act to those around us. Help us to live like you, to reflect you to the world around us, to be your representative. Thank you, God. Encourage your people today to believe that you are greater. You're greater than anything good, and you're greater than anything difficult. You are greater. We put our trust in you. It's in your mighty name we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Hang out if you need prayer. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Be reading the book of Hebrews.